Well, first, <clears throat> I want to thank Carl Laney for uh, picking up First uh, Peter for me while I was gone and while I was away from the church family, and I appreciate Carl being here last weekend for us. Uh, last Monday night was my last night in Cambridge, and we had a chance to go to a place called St. John's Chop House. St. John's Chop House. This was a prearranged meal that all of us who were part of the cohort were able to enjoy. Uh, so I spent uh, an evening there with 18 other friends from uh, Portland Seminary. Uh, we enjoyed that last meal, had a good time of rehearsing and thinking through uh, what we were uh, learning and experiencing there in Cambridge. When we entered the restaurant, we noticed that there were several signs that looked like this sign, several signs that looked like this. Mind your head. Mind your head. Now, the reason that they had these signs was because in the restaurant and in some places, uh, particularly that restaurant, St. John's Chop House, uh, the uh, door sills, the doorways and so forth, were a lot lower. So when you walk through them, they were built originally for shorter people. So when I walked through them, they were right about here. <laughs> and so you had to bow down in order to kind of get through them. And so they had these all over the restaurant, mind your head. Unfortunately for me, I didn't mind my head a couple of times because, you know, you get in the habit of just walking. And so uh, that particular sign right there did a little bit of damage to me. Um, I was walking into the place where we were eating and a waiter kind of distracted me and said something to me and I kept walking and bam, boy, I just, I mean, I have a bruise still right here on my head from that and it kind of snapped my neck back as a matter of fact. So for like two days, I was just, oh doing that, but I hadn't minded my head, okay? I hadn't minded my head. I, I probably should have looked a little bit better, but um, I didn't. I didn't. Well, I'd like to use this simple sign this morning. I'd like to use this simple sign as a kind of metaphor of what Peter is encouraging us to do in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 to 19, and we're going to look on this subject of minding your head, but not in the same way, not in the same way. We're going to be looking at it as far as your mind is concerned when it comes to suffering, minding your head, minding what's going on inside your head when suffering takes place. Now in chapter three, verse eight, on down to our text today, Peter has been kind of rehearsing again and again how we as a people respond when the pressure is on. How we go about pressing on when the pressure is on, particularly in the area of suffering. And Peter right now is going to remind them again to keep their head in the game. To keep their head in the game. That's what you often hear. You'll hear somebody say, hey, keep your head in the game. In other words, whenever there's a trial or a situation or something that's troubling you, it's important to keep your mind in the game, to keep your head in the game, to keep your focus so that you don't fall away. And Peter is really concerned here that perhaps even though he's been teaching and sharing and people are reading this letter, he, continue to, he continues to kind of remind them to keep their head in the game. It may be that he had picked up that some were beginning to struggle a little bit with the whole issue of suffering in their thinking. Some were beginning to say, hey, why is this going on? What's really happening? Because Peter seems to be repeating this theme of handling suffering over and over and over again. And so here in 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 to 19, he says, listen, keep your head in the game. In other words, mind your head. Think about these things. And we all have moments when we have to keep our head in the game. Sometimes we're treated unfairly by a family member. Maybe there's misunderstanding or there's relationship tension. And we start to experience a certain amount of tension inside of us. And Peter would say, no, keep your head in the game. Mind your head. Maybe there's a financial loss. And you're wondering, oh my goodness, how am I going to manage this? This is just something that I was not prepared for. Peter wants us to mind our head there as well mind our head. Maybe there's a sudden health reversal. Maybe all of a sudden, you know, things seem to be going along and you just get this diagnosis and you go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was the case. I 
had no idea that that was going on in my body. And pe- Peter would say, okay, mind your head. Keep your head thinking about very important things. Because, you know, whenever we begin to lose our thinking and we begin to ta- motions begin to take over, uh, sometimes we can begin to act or make decisions inappropriately. For instance, take sports. When too much emotion spills into the game or into your game in sports, you've got to all of a sudden ask yourself, hold on, hold on. Let me think through what the game plan is. You can always see that when you watch tennis or you watch Wimbledon or you watch golf. One of the disciplines of these athletes is that even though they might be behind, they mind their heads. (laughs) They say, well, wait a minute. I have to continue to think clearly about what's going on. What's my next shot? What do I do on the next hole? Okay, I got a bad, you know, shot there. Or, you know, I failed over here. What is my next shot? What do I do? We've got to somehow mind our heads in the midst of all that. And that's what Peter is asking us to think about when suffering comes. And particularly here, this suffering that's going on here is a suffering because they were believers. They were Christians. Some of them were Gentiles. And Gentiles did not experience a lot of persecution, by the way. A lot of the Jews did that were there in Peter's day, but the Gentiles didn't. I mean, they, they didn't experience the persecution that the Jews faced. And so some of these Gentiles might have been saying, hey, uh, Peter, you know, <laughs> my life was really difficult before I became a follower of Jesus, and it doesn't appear to be getting any better. And things just don't seem to be working out. And maybe they're beginning to wonder, hey, what in the world is going on when it comes to the Christian life. I mean, you know, yeah, I understand God's grace and mercy, and that's fantastic, but what about all this stuff going on in my life right now? How do I handle all this? And Peter says here in this particular text, you know what? You got to mind your head. You got to mind your head. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at three stabilizing thoughts to consider. Three stabilizing thoughts, things that you can put into your mind that when you're in the midst of suffering or you're in the midst of a difficulty, you can think about. And some thoughts that you might want to preload into your mind so that you can mind your head in the midst of some very difficult times that you might face in whatever they may be. And the first thought, the first stabilizing thought is this, is I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. There should be an N on the back of that. Conclusio looks Italian, but it it really should be. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. Notice verse 12 here. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Don't jump to conclusions. Um, don't, Don't think that, oh, God is punishing me here or this shouldn't be happening, you know. Peter is writing again to a number of non-Jewish people who are wondering what in the world is going on here. And uh, he wants them to know that this is not surprising. This is not surprising. Once they made a decision for Jesus Christ and he became the focus of their lives, things changed. And uh, people saw them differently. In fact, the goodness that came into their lives, the goodness that often comes when we follow Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, can often become a liability, can become a source of friction. And that's what was going on. These Gentiles have made a decision, and their whole worldview has changed. Their whole lives were changed. Everything changed, and goodness took over. And all of a sudden, some of the practices that they had before, the, the pagan practices and maybe some of the rituals, they were putting aside in order to follow Jesus, in order to make him Lord, in order to emphasize him. And that goodness that comes into our lives as believers often brings about a certain amount of persecution. And when that persecution comes, sometimes we can start to jump to conclusions. Well, maybe, maybe this Christian life isn't what it ought to be. Or maybe God is persecuting me. Or maybe God has left me. Or maybe God isn't there. And Peter is saying, no, no, don't be surprised. Don't jump to conclusions. This is not strange. You know, if you're a believer and you know Jesus Christ, You can just count on it. Your goodness, your life, your decisions, the way you live is going to result in a certain amount of persecution. It's going to result in a certain amount of misunderstanding. That's what it means to be a believer. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's going to be that way. Funny, you know, walking around Cambridge, um, 
here are these great towers of learning. In fact, many of these colleges have names like Christ's College or Jesus College. Jesus College. In fact, the place I stayed was on Jesus Lane. And in order for me to get to the coffee shop uh, or to get to Jesus Lane, uh, which was kind of funny because we took this bus from the airport uh, National Express, and it dropped us off just like a bus stop, like you would have a TriMet right in the middle of Cambridge. I didn't know where I was. I'd never been to Cambridge before. <laughs> so we stopped somebody on the street and said, hey, where's Jesus Lane, by the way? Well, they all knew where Jesus Lane is. And they said, well, Jesus Lane is down there, but you have to take a right at Emmanuel <laughs> to get to Jesus Lane. But you know, that's just, that's just talk. That's just... Stuff. It's on Jesus' lane. You've got to go right on Emmanuel. Now, whether or not <clears throat> that person had any kind of faith or not is another issue. Back there, it was just kind of a, well, yeah, we're on Jesus' lane and I go to Christ College. But whether or not they actually have any faith at all is a totally, totally different thing. And you could be going to Jesus' College and still be very persecuted, even though you're at Jesus' College, which is very interesting, very interesting. And he says here, look, don't jump to conclusions. But there is one conclusion you can jump to. Look at verse 13. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Rejoice. It's just part of being a believer. If you're going to display the goodness of Christ, if you're going to live a different kind of lifestyle, if your goal is to reflect Jesus, just plan on being misunderstood. Sometimes in the political realm, if you share your ideas, you, you don't plan on it when you look at it from a Christian perspective. He says, rejoice in your suffering. Rejoice in your suffering. Let's look at some scriptures that point this out to us. Let's look at some scriptures that point out, uh, out this to us. Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Jesus, in talking to the two people on the road to Emmaus, is trying to explain the fact that the Messiah had to suffer. They were struggling with it. They said, this Jesus came. We thought he was going to be the Messiah. You know, but he got crucified. And uh, guess what? Some women said he rose, but we haven't seen him. And you know what? This, this is not a good thing. The person we thought was the Messiah. And Jesus says, don't you know? Don't you know? This is what is, is, he's about. He was going to suffer. He was going to suffer. Suffering was part of his calling. Hebrews eleven twenty six. Moses said uh, says about Moses, he he would ultimately find great suffering because he chose not to be called a son of Pharaoh. He chose that. It comes when we make these kinds of decisions. The apostles in Acts chapter five and verse forty one, they felt that it was great because they were worthy uh, to suffer disgrace for the sake of the name. It's all part of it. It's all part of being a believer. And guess what Paul and Silas were doing when they were in the prison? What were they doing? Singing, right? Singing. They weren't sitting there and just kind of licking their wounds. They're singing away. Why? Because that is part of what it means to be a believer. So don't be surprised if there's misunderstanding. It, it's all part of living for the kingdom of God. It's all a big part of it. It's kind of a, kind of a badge of honor. You know, uh, any of you see the movie Jaws? Any of you see the movie Jaws? Yeah, you know that movie. You know, that, that, that's an interesting movie because for half the movie, you never see the fish. Do you know that? Half the movie, you never see the fish. All you hear is that creepy music, right? You know? Dun, 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 right? Some of you already have said I'm not going swimming this summer at all. Okay? But you hear that music. You hear that music. And in Jaws, remember they're on the boat and they're trying to catch the shark and they're comparing their scars, right? Remember? One puts his leg up and says, I got hit by a thresher shark. And the other one says, yeah, I got bit by a tiger shark right there. Well, in some ways, we have to be careful with this, but in some ways, this is a badge of honor. Suffering is kind of a way to say, you know what? I'm living the Christian life. It's one of my scars. I have a scar right here on my chin. And it reminds me of the fact that I played hockey because I got hit in the mouth with a hockey puck when I was a kid. And so I kind of look at that when I look at a mirror and go, yeah, see, you were young once, you know. <laughs> you did actually, you actually were able to play hockey one time. So you might not think you're a Navy SEAL. I can't see myself as a hockey player anymore. But, but that's it. It's a badge of honor that we wear. 
And that's what he says here. Look, he just says, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So put that in your mind. Don't, don't jump to conclusions. Don't, don't think that God is persecuting you or harming you. No, no, no. This is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now you can just see Peter. This next section is really interesting because you could just see Peter maybe hearing the voice of Jesus in his mind found in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, do not be afraid. Just as they persecuted the prophets, so they will persecute you. From Matthew chapter 5, 11 to 12. And Peter might be picking up a little sounding of the Holy Spirit as he's writing these words because he's thinking, oh yeah, I remember Jesus saying something about that. And the next thing, let's look at it this way. I'm going to let this particular act of suffering in this situation be a confidence builder. Be a confidence builder. Now let's read this. Let's go through it. If you suffer, it should not be as a... Mur or let's look at verse 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. You're blessed. Just remember that. This is a, this is a blessing. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or as a meddler. There is some kind of suffering. I mean, if we break the law, if we do something foolish and we're suffering there, that's not the same kind of suffering Peter's talking about. That's suffering based on what I could say is stupidity. <laughs> suffering based on bad choices. That's not suffering that, that you know, is coming to you directly as a Christian. That's suffering because you, you know, we make bonehead decisions and sometimes we suffer as a result of them. Look at verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for the judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the, uh, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Wow, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now you might say, what does that mean? It's time for the judgment to begin. Well, what Peter is saying there is, look, the suffering we're going through, the main purpose of it is not only to refine us now, but to get us ready for what? For what? For the return of Jesus. For the coming of the King. That's what it is. And so when we suffer persecution here, or we go through some kind of refinement, this is an indication that God is going to be returning. And guess what? That's an indication that judgment is going to come to all who don't know Jesus Christ. So when he's talking about judgment beginning with the house of God, he's talking about the fact that God is refining us. God is working on us. God wants us ready when he appears. God wants us to be people who uh, when, we, when he comes, we're ready for him to come. And so that's what that judgment means. God is working on each and every one of us. And if he's doing that and prepping us for what's ahead, guess what? Judgment is going to come as well. Judgment is going to come. And that's a difficult thing to think about. And if you don't know Jesus, listen, some of the persecution that goes on, and if you've been kind of, you know, slamming into Christians... <laughs> You know what? Guess what? That's just an indication of the judgment that's going to come upon you. And you need to really consider that. You need to consider that. Judgment is going to come upon you. Notice what he says. Notice this. For the spirit of the glory of Christ rests on you. Let it be a confidence builder. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. There's a beautiful story here, and you know the story. It's the story of Stephen found in Acts chapter 6. The story of Stephen found in Acts chapter 6. So let's take a look at this really quick. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. You see the glory of God here on Stephen. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Now Stephen, a man full of the grace and power, did wonders and miraculous signs among the people, Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the providence of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. Notice that. 
Then they secretly persuaded some men. We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses and all that went on there. Look at verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That's exactly what Peter's talking about. When we handle this kind of persecution, when we see it as a confidence builder, you know, it says the Holy Spirit rests on us and you almost have the face of an angel. People look at you and kind of go, wow, there's something a little bit different about how they're handling this situation. And notice the word Christian in the text. That first came about, as you know, later on in the church. In fact, King Agrippa uses it in Acts chapter 26 and verse 28 as a sort of derogatory word. Do you think, Paul, you can make me a Christian, really? Do you really think so? Paul was being persecuted by Agrippa and the others around him. So all of this is to get us ready. So be confident. Be confident if others are misunderstanding you or persecuting you and it's because of your walk with God. Be confident. Be confident in that. Let it be a confidence builder that the Holy Spirit is really, really using you. Well, finally, let's look at one more thing. Not only, not only number one, should we be giving ourselves uh, and being careful not to jump to conclusions, and number two, that we, shouldn't be, uh, we should let it be a confidence builder, but also we should be sure that we're going to make some commitments. This is really important. Here's what you say in your mind. I'm going to make two commitments. I'm going to make two commitments in the midst of all this. Um, you know, athletes have a term. And, uh, and athletes have a term that they use, and they say this, no matter what, I'm going to play hurt. Athletes play hurt. And that's the way it is in the Christian life. You have to live the Christian life hurt sometimes. You have to play the Christian life hurt. And you have to make two commitments in your mind that no matter what happens, no matter what suffering occurs, no matter what goes on, I'm going to play hurt. I'm going to play hurt. Because you know what? Nobody likes an athlete who rolls over and gives up. You know, one of the things you'll see on ESPN or some of these sports programs is if, if an athlete seems like they're dogging it or they rolled over in the midst of a bad game, you're going to hear about it. You're going to hear about it. And nobody likes when people do that. You don't like a tennis player who does it or a golfer who just gives up or something like that. You learn how to play hurt. You just learn how to play hurt. And in order to do that, you make two key commitments in your mind. So, not only am I not going to jump to conclusions, and not only am I going to make this a confidence builder, but I'm going to make two key commitments. I want you to look at this word found in verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Let's look at that word. That word commit. That word was used um, for someone who would be going away on a trip. It describes this. Person's going away on a trip. They don't know when they're coming back. They have a certain amount of money. And so they take their money and their valuables over to a friend. This is before banks. Over to a friend. And they say, look, here's my life savings. I'm going away. I don't know if I'm coming back. But when I come back, I just need to know that you have this. Because this is my life savings. So when I get back, would you be sure to just protect it for me? So this was a way that we took, back then you would take your money or your valuables and you would give it to a friend. And you would deposit it to a friend. That's what that word means. You would deposit it to a friend. This was a sacred oath. If somebody came to you and said, would you watch my valuables? Would you take care of these things? Because there were no banks, there were no security systems, there were no lock boxes, there was nothing. Would you take these things I own and watch them for me while I'm gone? This was a sacred pledge. And if you said, yes, I will, that person, when they got back, you know what they expected? You to give it back to them. To give it back to them. And so Peter is saying, look, here's the first commitment you make. Number one, I will put my life into your hands. That's the deposit. Lord, no matter what goes on here in the suffering, no matter what happens, I will put my life into your hands for safekeeping. That's why Peter says, you commit yourself to your what? Faithful creator, right? 
Notice how he says that. Whenever you go through suffering, put it in your mind. God is faithful. He's going to take care of me so I can put whatever's going on right into his hands and he will take care of me no matter what. No matter how difficult the situation, God will be faithful to me. That's why Peter uses that word faithful, creator. In Psalm 31.5, Jesus does this on the cross, doesn't he? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, from uh, Lord, my faithful God. That's one of the seven last words of Jesus found in Psalm 31. I commit my, this whole situation. Father, I commit my spirit to you as I'm dying on this cross. I'm committing it to you. My faithful Father, my faithful God, I'm giving you my life right now. Secondly, I will put my focus on the needs of others. I will put my focus on the needs of others. Notice this. Not only do I deposit my life in God's hands in the midst of my suffering, you're going to take care of me. And Lord, guess what? I'm going to continue to do good. I'm going to play hurt. I'm going to continue to serve. I'm not going to drop out of the church. I'm not going to drop out of my responsibilities, if at all possible. There may be some reasons why that is, and there may be some, some things that go on that you know you can't continue on in certain areas. That happens to all of us. But overall, you say, you know what? I'm going to just continue to do good. No matter how hurt I am or whatever happens, I'm going to do the best I can with what you have given me. So number one, I'm going to put my life into your hands. You're going to be faithful. And number two, no matter what happens, I'm just going to keep doing good. I'm going to keep focusing on the needs of other people. That's probably one of the reasons that the movie Hacksaw Ridge was so popular, remember? The movie about Dawson Dawes during uh, World War II, remember that? An incredible film. Because even though he experienced such incredible persecution and he was being tested for his faith over and over again, what did he do? Good, good, good. He just kept rescuing people, good. He kept going back and rescuing people and doing good. He put his life into the hands of his faithful creator and continued to say, help me find just one more, Lord, just one more, just one more. So look, when persecution comes, when difficulties rise, when suffering comes... Mind your head. <laughs> Mind your head. Don't jump to conclusions. Look at the situation as a confidence builder. God is refining me for the time that he's coming. Think that way and then say, no matter what comes, I'm going to commit my life to you and I'm going to give myself to you. I'm going to mind my head. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, life is full of twists and turns and fraught sometimes with difficult challenges. And um, we can jump to conclusions about why they're happening. And we can say to ourselves, wow, um, this shouldn't be happening. But Lord, as we've learned today, suffering is a part of life, particularly that of someone who follows Jesus like us gathered here. It, it, it's a sign that we follow him because he himself suffered. And so, Lord, help us not to jump to conclusions. Help us to remember that this is an indication that even the goodness you bring into our lives can sometimes be misunderstood in a culture that sometimes looks for ways to take even the goodness that Christianity brings and turn it around for evil. And then, Lord, we pray that um, you would help it to be confident. Lord, let us be confident as we leave. Even though... Tough times may come. Let us have the confidence to know because you're prepping us for the time that you're coming and that's an indication that there will come a day when you will return and there will come a day when all will stand before you and judgment will come and they'll have to give an account. And Lord, you're prepping us now. You're prepping us now to get ready to spend life with you, not only here but later. And then Lord, in the midst of it all, we do pray that we would make these commitments, Lord, and we'd stick with it. We'd play hurt. We continue to do good for your kingdom regardless of what goes on. That's really the mark of a Christian. They just continue to move forward in spite of what happens to them. And so, Lord, we pray that we would mind our heads in the midst of the culture we live. In Jesus' name, amen.